Okay, so um, let's start. So, hello everybody. Um, welcome all and thank you for spending your weekend afternoon with us. Um, it is a beautiful day and we hope that folks are sitting by a window and taking in uh, the rays of the sun, but uh, we're excited that this day is just a beautiful day to kind of shine its light on um, today's event. Um, so to give you a little bit more information about myself, uh, my name is Christian Rodriguez and I'm the workshop director at Third World Newsreel. Um, and just to give you a little bit more information on what Third World Newsreel is for folks who may not be familiar, Third World Newsreel uh, is a progressive media center that prioritizes media by and about people of color and marginalized communities. Um, we're committed to using cinema as a tool to explore and address social justice uh, issues and we do this through the educational distribution and exhibition of our films as well as by providing media training to community members that can utilize these tools um, to promote um, and make social change in the world. Um, and so because this space is, uh, you know, we, we want to make the space an empowering space, a powerful space for our communities to build with each other, uh, to learn from each other. Um, and it is, we see this as an anti-oppressive space, right? We want to acknowledge too that it's important to note that we are not tolerating any oppressive, racist, sexist, homophobic language um, on our chat or anywhere on this gathering, right? So the chat is open so folks can write uh, questions, write uh, your comments in terms of what you think about the event, um, but we don't tolerate that language. Um, we, as I said before, we are a holding space rooted in community power that is challenging oppression. So if we do see language like that, we're going to have to remove you from the group. But uh, we hope that we're all here, right, uh, in the same kind of like space uh, vision uh, energy. So we hope to kind of have really good energies throughout the whole conversation today. Um, and so before we start the event, um, we thought that it'd be really important for us to do uh, an acknowledgement, right? So. Um, <clears throat> We would like to open our time together today by acknowledging the land upon which we're all standing on today um, and the people who have stewarded this land for ages. Every community owes its existence and vitality to the generations from around the world who have contributed their hopes, dreams, and energies that have led to this moment today. Um, some people have lived here for generations that cannot be counted. Uh, some were brought here against their will. Some were drawn to leave uh, their homes in hope for a better life. So beneath these lands of any uh, site in the United States, there are histories of belonging that have been erased, overlooked, contested, and forgotten. Um, truth and acknowledgement of uh, whose stories and lives we stand upon are critical to building mutual respect, connection across all the barriers of heritage, and the difference, and difference, sorry. Uh, the land we call Manhattan uh, the waters that surround this land were stewarded, kept, and cared by the people of the Lenape uh, In Lenape languages, the word Manhattan meant the island of many hills, while the Brooklyn tribe Lenape, the Canarsie, uh, part of Delaware Nation, lived in most of what became King and Queens County. Uh, the Canarsie had settlements in Bushwick, Gravesend, and Fort Hamilton. They called it the uh, Navac. Uh, so New York is also shaped by the many other lands from which people come from. Uh, including those who have flocked persecution, economic, political, and social insecurity, and sought a better life for themselves. So now let's pay respect to the indigenous and Afro descendants um, of this land, this history, and many parts of these stories we do not fully know. Please take a moment to consider the many legacies of violence, displacement, homelessness, migration, and settlement that brings us together here today. And please join us in uncovering these truths at any and all public events. Um, and so I, I did want to also just thank uh, greatly Betty Yu, who's our um, moderator for the panelists today, which I'll introduce in a little bit, um, and Patti Rodriguez from Mikasa, who um, added to this document, right, uh, in terms of honoring and res uh, paying respects to um, uh, our histories, right, um, and the histories of people who are not necessarily counted at, at all times. Um, and we do want to make sure that we uncover that and understand that this is um, part of our histories together. Um, and so finally, uh, just wanted to, to talk a little bit about um, how this brings us into today, right, into this event today. So um, this program, The War Against Gentrification, features one of uh, news, Newsreel's first uh, made films in 1971, Break and Enter, which streamed yesterday uh, and this morning. So we hope that you all had uh, time to watch it. Um, this is part of a series we're sponsoring called Organizing and Filmmaking Then and Now, where we are uh, screening the Newsreel classic films as well as newer pieces that address issues that can continue to impact our communities and bring filmmakers and activists uh, to a conversation together, right? Um, kind of marrying both the arts and uh, organizing aspect of uh, the tremendous work happening in the world today. Um, and just really importantly, just wanted to say that this event uh, was uh, 
uh, done in partnership with the Mayday Space. And initially, we had uh, hoped to do this in person. Um, uh, and so, you know, because of the environment that we're currently in with the pandemic, we were um, we we needed to, and we were able to actually transition this uh, virtually um, and bring it to more folks, uh, hopefully. Um, and then finally, this program was supported in part by National Endowment for the Arts, NISCA, and DCA, and they've been able to kind of support us in uh, having other events that we've done that were part of the series. Um, some of the de uh, events that we've had uh, to date have been liberation, uh, decarceration with the film out, uh, the making of revolutionary with uh, decarceration activists and filmmakers. We had fight uh, for our barrios, which uh, was a film that uh, what well, we we presented films. Uh, that talked about the history and organizing work of the Young Lords with filmmakers and activists. And then upcoming on May 30th, we have the battle uh, for our Chinatown, with the, which is uh, the film from Spikes to Spindles, filmmakers and artists, activists, including WOW and the Chinatown Art Brigade that will be joining us for that event. And so that's uh, on May 30th upcoming. Um, and then, uh, you know, as we go into this, I just wanted to give a little bit of a rundown of what to expect for this event. So, um, as I mentioned earlier, right, uh, Break and Enter was available uh, for free streaming prior to this event. So we hope that folks got to see it. Um, if you do have questions about like how to watch it, if you weren't able to watch it, um, then uh, we would ask that you maybe chat that into the the chat section and a TWN uh, staff member uh, or community member will help us kind of get you the information that you need for that. Um, but uh, what we'll start with is a screening of uh, another piece called the Mayday, uh, Mayday, the Art of Building Community. Um, and then from there, we'll go into our panel discussion, which will be moderated by Betty Yu. And then we'll, uh, as we go into the panel discussion, just remember that you can ask your questions and add comments to the chat. I will be moderating or looking at the, uh, uh, reviewing the chat section just to make sure that I collect all the information uh, that we can then uh, bring into the, the panel discussion. Um, and then you'll learn about our, our amazing panels who are here, which is a good mixture of uh, filmmakers and community organizers and activists that have worked throughout the different uh, 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 journeys of, of the work that you're going to be seeing today. <clears throat> and so um, just to get us started with the film, um, uh, so the Mayday, uh, Mayday, the Art of Building Community is a film that was produced uh, by TWN production students. So uh, Third World Newsreel has a production program for um, community members looking to build their experiences as media makers, as storytellers, um, to tell and, and, and uh, uplift stories uh, of folks doing really amazing work, uh, particularly in New York City, um, challenging oppression. And so this film was a film that our 2016 um, students uh, made um, really highlighting the, the the tremendous work happening in Bushwick um, that you'll you'll get to see right now. As soon as I found out that Made a Space existed within my own community where I grew up, the fact that there was this new social justice center in my neighborhood, you know, so accessible right there, and for me, it was a an opportunity for me to really like delve into organizing work within the community itself. And part of the mission of Mayday is to um, be a space where culture in a variety of forms is Created or there's a culture that exists in society and there's ways that we want to transform that or take elements of it that we find joyful and empowering and then play with it and move it into a place where more people feel that way and more people feel like, yeah, I want to be a part of that. I think it's really important that Mayday has a space for arts production. Uh, as a means to allow people to manifest ideas they have, messages they have, things they want to say in a way that's understood by a lot of different people. The interesting thing about this space is that so many groups utilize it. So on any given night, there's like young kids doing a theater club, there's a Spanish class, there's a yoga class, like there's, all, there's a panel, there's always like something new going on. Yeah, there's been a lot of like health and wellness programs. One of the first big events we had here was Indigenous Peoples Resistance Day, and there was a big celebration and a dance, and that was a 
part of lifting up a culture that is, you know, largely not lifted up and, you know, doesn't have a place. So that, that is also just as important as being able to have a place to make a banner. At the same time, there's a lot of projects that are taking root, um, led by people who grew up in this neighborhood, who are really um, leaders in the kind of work that they're doing. So someone like Patti, who's doing Casa Noa Su Casa, um, trying to use art to bring to life um, in a creative way the, the issues of gentrification and displacement. Um, is like really exciting project. Made a space being in Bushwick, you know, being so close to my home really allowed the opportunity for me to like really delve in, into community-based building within my own neighborhood, like with with my neighbors, you know, with mm -hmm. so it, it just was a natural fit for me to be able to do that. Since last year, I, I've, I've been part of the uh, Mayday Space Programming Committee. So I, I brought this up to the program committee and was like, look, I want to create a workshop, you know, and, and this is what it's going to be about, you know, and I want to create signs that educate on displacement of our communities, of our people of color, of our working classes in, in the area of Bushwick, you know. So I, I wanted to create signs that were very, very blunt uh, about what the situation of what what what's happening in in Bushwick, which is prevalent, you know. I mean, it, and it quick. I mean, we we've been gentrified really quickly in just a few years. And we are the affected, the ones who who organize the Mikasa no Sukasa project. The members of Mikasa no Sukasa are people who who are living that reality, who are being impacted by these higher, you know, paying tenants, you know, gentrifiers. Um, and you know, raise the rent everywhere so that the people who are already here can no longer pay the rent and they can't live here anymore. So I thought this was kind of a great opportunity to create like an art project that would empower the community by if whoever has them on their homes and educate the community, but also to educate actual gentrifiers to see like, yo, you know what you're contributing to, this is what's, what's happening. And it really humanizes the homes, these signs. So, um, so, I thought it was important that we create this art project, it's like art resistance. And so I think it's really important that this space carves out a place in this neighborhood where people can make something that speaks to them um, and holds their voice in their unique way and it's lifted up and respected and put on a platform in any way we can. We're creating art for ourselves. We're creating that art and we're putting it out there ourselves. So uh, thank you all for watching that. And again, just so you know, um, I will put the link again for uh, the video just in case you had any um, issues with the load, but just if you want to revisit it and see uh, the film all over again. <laughs> but uh, just to, to get us going into the, uh, the, the event, um, I wanted uh, to go uh, bring uh, Betty Yu into the, the discussion. Um, so just to, uh, sorry, I just want to make sure that I have what I have in front of me uh, to introduce Betty Yu. So Betty Yu is a socially engaged multimedia artist, filmmaker, educator, and activist born and raised in New York City uh, to Chinese American parents. Uh, Miss Yu integrates documentary film, new media platforms, and community-infused approaches into her practice. Um, and she is a co-founder of the Chinatown Art Brigade, a cultural collective using art to advance anti-gentrification organizing. And so for this uh, panel, you know, uh, Betty is going to be moderating the panel um, and we'll be introducing the panelists but just note too again folks uh, you're welcome to add your questions uh, for you know the uh, of the panelists of the films that you just watched as well as break and enter um, and I will be moderating and looking at those questions and we'll ask them at the panel at uh, the Q&A section of the panel so go ahead Betty. hi everyone can everyone hear me just want to make sure yep thumbs up is okay okay cool I know sometimes the volume it depends <laughs> Um, so I can shout or just be lower. Um, but it's really great to see everyone and I'm really, I've respected uh, everyone's work for a very long time who's on this panel and um, this film. 
uh, is so relevant today. So we're really excited to um, have a discussion with folks who made the film, with folks who are organizing right now in our neighborhoods against gentrification. Um, and even though we're supposed to be on pause, we all know that Corona capitalism is, is, is doing its work behind the scenes or maybe right in our faces, right? Um, and so to also talk about, um, you know, the relevancy of anti-gentrification organizing and housing, even in the midst of this pandemic, which I know that we'll, we'll get to with the panelists. But first wanted to, uh, and, and thank you, Christian, for the land acknowledgement. I mean, when we talk about gentrification and displacement, we absolutely have to acknowledge that people are still fighting and we are, and, and unless you are indigenous to land, you know, we're settlers on, on stolen land. But anyway, I wanted to introduce um, and, and read really short bios for everyone. As a reminder, the, what we're gonna do is basically, um, we're gonna ha have a, a short 30 minute sort of uh, discussion that's sort of uh, moderated by me with questions and a conversation with everyone, um, the panel that is. And then um, as Christian said, people can, you know, chat in their questions, even along the way, if you can think of it and you, so you don't forget it. And we will pull those together and there'll be at least a half hour to 40 minutes for discussion, for Q&A. And I know there's a lot of expertise in this space here, in this virtual space. So really, really uh, would be great to hear from you all. Okay, so we're gonna kick it off with some intros. Uh, so Esperanza Martel, amazing, amazing human. <laughs> That's not in there, but just want to say that. <laughs> Is an activist, educator, and more. She was part of Operation Move In and El Comité depicted in the 1971 newsreel film, Break and Enter, where a mostly woman of color led group took over empty buildings in the Upper West Side in New York City. She also participated in the making of the film with newsreel. Carol Forrester is a filmmaker and activist and as a member of newsreel, uh, as a member of newsreel and was one of the makers of the film, Break and Enter. Newsreel, which became the third world newsreel, started as a radical film collective that documented many of the social movements of the, 19, of the late 1960s and early 1970s. Pati Rodriguez is an organizer, co-founder, and spokesperson of Mikasa no Sukasa, an anti-capitalist collective of New Yorkers based in Bushwick, Brooklyn, using art and direct action to build a visible resistance to gentrification, displacement, and the criminalization of poor black and brown folks in New York City and beyond. Josh Carrera is a member of Mayday Space Collective, an organizing center and social hub in Bushwick that, has, that is both a neighborhood uh, resource and a citywide destination for engaging programming, radical thought, debate, and connection. Um, so um, what we're gonna do is um, actually, I'm gonna ask Josh to kick it off for us first. So uh, this first part, I'm gonna ask uh, specific questions to each uh, panelist and to speak for a few minutes. Um, and then we'll, we'll open it up for discussion with questions that I have. But Josh, um, would you like to uh, go ahead and context contextualize the film in, in, in terms of today and what you all are doing since I know the pandemic has really shifted your focus uh, dramatically? Sure, thank you so much, Betty. And thank you, uh, Third World News Real and Christian and everyone joining here uh, in New York, across the five boroughs and across the country. So yeah, just, I want to express gratitude. My name is Josh. I use he, him pronouns. I'm the project coordinator of Mayday Space, which like you saw in the video, is a social justice radical organizing space based in Brooklyn, New York, specifically Bushwick. Um, a little bit about what I do. I'm kind of a jack of all trades uh, when it comes to the project. Um, if Mayday were open now, which is not because of the pandemic, I would be the person responsible for managing all of the events you saw in that video as well as the volunteer and the labor and the outreach and the media that would take to make each of those events. So that's, that's, that was my job before the pandemic. And after the pandemic, um, we shifted our efforts to meet the material needs of people in the neighborhood in Bushwick. Before the pandemic hit, we were already in a food crisis. Bushwick was already a food desert and people were already hungry. Um, and the pandemic just exacerbated that, just like disaster capitalism always does. And so what we did um, to meet the need was we shut our operations down, partnered up with several grassroots and uh, nonprofits in the neighborhood and in the surrounding neighborhoods, and were managed and managed to build a relationship with one of the larger nonprofit and foundations in New York City that helps distribute food to those uh, New Yorkers most in need, and that's um, City Harvest. 
And so just really briefly, um, I thought it would be important to contextualize this because what you saw in the video was all the beautiful and amazing work we did before the pandemic. And we quickly adapted and we're not doing much of that now. Instead, we're shifting our entire uh, organizational efforts to meet the food crisis. And um, basically, uh, again, we're shut down, but every Wednesday, a crew of 10 to 12 volunteers get together and um, distribute around 700 bags of food that feed around 1,500 families of residents in Bushwick and the surrounding Brooklyn neighborhoods uh, that live in public housing, which in New York City we, we usually refer to as NYCHA, uh, which is the government entity that manages and oversees the public housing. Um, and so, yeah, this has been something completely new for our organization. We're, we're a very scrappy grassroots project. We have two part-time staff. One of them is Rahel, which you see right here, and myself, and then we're a collective of nine people, all volunteer-led. And so being an organization that originally focused on doing events in the space, this has been a new area of work for us, but it's been very rewarding. We are meeting the needs, the material needs, the food needs of people in Bushwick, and um, we're gonna continue to do this. And then hopefully when the pandemic is over, um, we know that the crisis is not gonna be over. People are still gonna be fed. People are still gonna have economic needs. And so we're thinking as an organization, you know, we can't go back to the way things were. So what does it mean to be a radical social center um, that evolves when a crisis like this hits? And that's the next part of our, our chapter that we're trying to figure out. So I'll pause there and, and thank you, Betty, for the opportunity. Great, thank you so much, Josh. Um, yeah, and we'll definitely hear a lot more uh, about what you're doing, uh, so important. Um, I forgot to mention that I'm also on the board of, of Third World Newsreel, um, and uh, thank you, JT, for inviting me to moderate. Just wanted to throw that in there. Um, so um, the, next uh, the next question is uh, for Carol and Esperanza, but I think we'll hear from Carol first. Um, and this is about the making of the film, right? This really powerful gem. Um, can you talk about this film and how you gained access and collab collaborated with these powerful women of color who led the fight? And, and now, of course, um, you know, the power, you know, if you can talk a little bit about the power of sharing the film with the community then and the public then and their response, and now because it's still so relevant, I mean, 100% relevant right now today. Um, so we'll start with Carol and then we'll go to Esperanza. Please, Carol, kick us off. Okay. Thank you. I just want to say congratulations to the May Day Collective because the work you're doing is amazing and it was wonderful seeing it on film and seeing the photographs that you showed, Josh. So uh, thank you for sharing that. Um, we, Newsreel, at the time when we just, we found out about what was happening in the community on the Upper West Side, we went over there and talked to people we were interested in understanding what the struggle was that was going on there. We needed to know and be able to be part of the story. And we, we didn't see ourselves so much as filmmakers, although that, that was the task, that was the work that we did. But we saw ourselves as being part of the organization of what was going on there. We wanted to be helpful, we wanted to be useful. So we were listening to the stories that people had to tell and at the same time recording it. And what we would do is after we did that work of recording people's stories, we would go back once we got the film back from uh, Do Art and it was a different process than you have today. But when we'd get the film back, we would show the film to the people who were involved in Operation Move-In. And we would get their critique. We would ask them if what we, what we had recorded was telling their story authentically. Was it honest? Was it true to the struggle that they were engaged in? And if not, what did we need to fix? And sometimes we did those showings outside in the street. We'd put the film up against the wall and we'd all sit out and watch what we had shot and we would talk about it. 
So the making of the film was kind of integral to the struggle that was happening at the time on the Upper West Side. It wasn't something that was done um, I mean, obviously we worked in an editing room to cut the film, but we kept true to the source of the struggle. We saw ourselves as being participants in the struggle. We, we didn't feel our, that we were separate for what, from what was going on there. That's why when we uh, made an alliance with El Comité and I got to know Espy, we were friends and comrades in the struggle. And um, we weren't just these like filmmakers who came in and tried to, um, I don't know, you know, we weren't just documenters. We were there every day. We went to those meetings. We listened. We went to the break-ins. We were up in the apartments. We helped people clean if that was what was needed. Um, it was it was a very um, I don't know. It was a time when we could feel constructive, not just as being. Uh, documenters, although that was our primary work. And we did a lot of that. So uh, it, was, it was a very important time in my life. It taught me the importance of storytelling and of people being able to share their stories with other people. And uh, I've taken that to heart. And that's part of what I do even today is um, be someone who gathers stories and shares. Thank you so much, Carol. Um, Esperanza, um, okay, uh, same question to you. So just about the, you know, the, the process of making it, clearly you all were behind and in front of the camera, right, as activists and organizers. Um, and sort of, uh, if you can remember sort of the impact that it had then, and of course today, so relevant, right, today in, in our fights. Okay, for those of you who saw the film, I think it's real important a, to put a context within the film, to put a historical context, because this film did not spring out of anywhere, neither did Operation Move-In, and neither did El Comité. Folks have been fighting for Ethical housing uh, from the first from the first people uh, to land and take our land and take our land so so we were a historical les legacy, and we were in a community where folks not only it have already been gentrified. My family and many families were in the 50s, were gentrified when they built a Lincoln Center that was a Puerto Rican, mostly Puerto Rican community. And we were displaced. And we were, when we moved uptown, uh, to Harlem. From there, we will displace again to build a more housing for people who had more money than us. We were, or I was, we were the children of the factory workers, of the the maids, the the construction worker. We were part of the poor working class in the city. In the area that we were in, on the west side, 80, from 86th Street to 96th Street, where, where the squatters, the original squatters were, it was mostly in the middle. I don't know if people know the west side, but from a Broadway, to Riverside, that's all white. And from Columbus to Central Park, that was all white. Um, upper class, 
middle upper class folks basically and we were right in, in the middle columbus and amsterdam so when we think of the squatters just figure columbus and amsterdam 86th street to 96th street and as again mostly puerto ricans there were dominicans there were some cubans and they were white allies mostly a uh, people who were anti-racist anti most of us all of us were anti-racist anti-capitalist anti comité was anti-imperialist and anti-colonialism given that most of us came from Puerto Rico and Puerto Rico is a colony of the United States and it was a very it's people forget the Vietnam War we were fighting against the war many of the people who came the soldiers who came back eh, with Puerto Rican Dominican or Cuban or other Latin Americans and African Americans couldn't find jobs couldn't find housing it's the same thing that's going on with Schultz soldiers now and that's who the, who the people were who were in the in the battlefield the term a people of color then evolved into the 80s so we didn't use that term right we were either black puerto ricans asians not even Asians, you were Chinese or Japanese. I mean, we were identifying as our ethnicity. Um, so also keep that in mind. Now, a, the other thing that's important, I think, within the context is that Operation Movement was basically a coalition. It was, even though it was mostly led by people of color. Two of the primary people were white women, um, open to leadership of people of color. And they were also left folks. So this was propelled by the left. You know, I see the May Day Center and I was blessed to be there once. A, I spoke there once, um, and I think of, you know, we had two cultural centers like that. One basically for the white hippie types, and the other one more a black and, and Latin American, um, more integrated, more integrated, everybody was welcome. But imagine two of those. Imagine a storefront in the different storefronts. I guess they were like maybe 10 blocks away from each other. And then a, imagine having a daycare center, um, a martial arts center. We had an Asian group, Chicken Come Home to Roost. We had El Comité, and there were some other spaces, right, that I don't remember, but there were many, and all the places were occupied by community people, by community people. So we were very, very serious in, in how we organize this work. Now, El Comité, which I was on the Central Committee of at the time, um, it's important is that the Young Lords and the Black Panthers were organizing, all young people were organizing all over the city. The difference with, between us and the Young Lords is that Young Lord's average age at the time was like 16. And we were um, in our 20s. We were in our early and mid 20s. And again, as I said before, a lot of the young, the men were 
ex-Vietnam veterans. So we had some serious, serious skills. This is important to understand the takeover, which is, yes, the community organization planned it and everything. And Comité was the security, the military arm of all the actions. Um, and you can do this kind of work, given that we live in a police state, without really thinking on a high level of security. The other thing is, and we gave Carol a very hard time because when she, especially when she was editing, because we wanted to make sure that certain of our members did not show up in the film. I think in, in the new rendition of it, I show up more than I remember originally in the film, so maybe they slipped me there again. But a, we were determined that this was going to be about the community not about the leaders, not about the leaders, even though the leaders came out of the community. We weren't, you know, this was not our job. This was everyone fighting for their lives, fighting for their lives, basically. Um, many of the people in El Comité I mean, the day that we did the takeover in a comité, it was at the baseball, baseball team. And um, that actually took over the original comité. You know, these were my friends. These were people I had been hanging out with in the streets of New York, heavy duty. Um, so it was a community effort. Some of us had more skills than others and we pulled them all together. Um, it was really exciting times and it was really hard times, right? Organizing is, feeds you, feeds you. And at the same time, we had to deal with serious issues like um, a drug use, alcoholism, emotional issues, a physical abuse of women. Um, we dealt with everything, right? We, and, and, and most of our organization were infiltrated at the time, so we had to deal with that issue also. So just that's the context of this film. This film that shows women is standing up for their human rights the film that shows a community. I mean, I don't know if anybody has done it since then, taking over a high riser, right? Taking over a high riser. And we were in touch with every group organizing all over the city and the boroughs. We were connected as a community. So, and connected to the issues, you know, the, the, when, when Attica happened and, and the, the massacre of folks in, in Attica happened, we had a massive demonstration citywide and we joined it from the west side. We had a march starting at the office of Comité and moving up. Amsterdam, Columbus and Amsterdam Avenue as we kept picking up people. So it was more than just housing. We addressed every issue. Um, in the actual filming, as I said, we made sure that certain people were not in it and other people's were a, and, you know, we didn't trust anybody. So 
a Carol knowing or not knowing always there was always security watching her you know we were very very closed in and we had a lot to lose and this film was used to organize the community so that was what we wanted to do to organize the community mm -hmm. um with the film okay mm -hmm. thank you so much esmeralda that was really important context that you provided um for the film making of the film and just to clarify um the film break and enter um that we're talking about um is a third world news film third world newsreel film back then newsreel um that was uh available yesterday and uh part of today and esperanza and carol are two of the filmmakers um, of it and then the film that we just saw um earlier at the beginning of this uh program was the five minute piece that students of the third world newsreel workshop made about may day space just to to clarify but um, um I, and just to really quickly say because i do see a lot of folks asking questions about like i didn't get to see break and enter yep. which is completely fine uh we are extending the free stream of break and enter until tonight so just make sure right after this you get onto your computers or get get the link uh, again if you registered to the event uh, you should have received the link yesterday to watch the film. Um, and then again, we'll, we'll probably post the link uh, right now in the chat too, or uh, by the end of the chat. Yeah, um, I'm gonna um, throw the next question to Patti. Um, but I just wanna say Esperanza, I think you opened up and, and really uh, provided uh, a, a really important container for us as we look back and what can we learn from past social movements, which oftentimes, right, we are reinventing those wheels. I um, mean, of course, conditions change, but like we've been saying, disaster capitalism and, and all what we're seeing now, not in a way, not much has changed. And resistance has always uh, uh, taken taken hold in communities that are most impacted. So really, thank you for grounding us in that. It's so important. Um, but Patti, um, so question, next question is for you. So in the short film, um, of course, we heard a little bit about uh, Mikasa Noah Sukasa's work. Uh, but that was a few years ago when that was filmed. I know you guys have been doing so much amazing organizing uh, using arts and culture, anti-gentrification work um, in Bushwick. So if you can uh, bring us up to speed and talk about your work, uh, that would be great. Sure. Uh, thank you, Betty. And thank you, Christian and the Third World Newsreel folks for having us here today to explain the work that we're doing. And also, I got to say that film uh, with Esperanza and Carol, like that, it, it was really inspiring to just see how badass, like people just went in and took over buildings. Like, I wish that, that could be happening now, although we do live in a whole different reality and you know, security is leveled up and it's just crazy now with these luxury buildings. Um, but yeah, so Mikasa no Sukasa a long time ago, uh, well, not a long time ago, but in 2015, we started Mikasa no Sukasa with the first project um, with the light signs, as y'all saw in the video. Um, since then, we had a second light sign um, installment, like because the first one was all over Bushwick. The second year we did it all over New York City. We actually teamed up um, because we, and that was our first year to really like connect with all the different grassroots anti-gentrification, anti-displacement organizations from around New York City. Um, so in 2017, or, or 16 and 17, um, we, um, that winter we put, we installed light signs, like maybe about 40 light signs all over New York City and some, one went to Jersey City, one went upstate too, where, where it's being heavily gentrified and in other heavily gentrified areas in the Bronx, Queens, uh, Chinatown. We actually worked with um, Betty with the Chinatown Art Brigade to get some signs out there. And and we, um, the way that we did the light sign projects was, as you saw, through these um, community uh, art builds that we would create at the Bay Day space, which is our base basically for organizing. Because to tell you the truth, as I said in the video, like I would not be like organizing within my community at this level if it hadn't been for the Mayday space, that there was a space there actually there available to me as a single mom who really doesn't have time to really be able to be anywhere. Like it, it, it afforded me the, uh, the way to really get active and be able to be local and still be productive with my, with my family life and home and stuff. So it, um, I, I'm always sort of forever thankful for that. Um, and which is also why I'm also part of the Mayday space collective. Um, now the, with uh, the st after the second year that we did the citywide light signs and everything and the the point of the whole of of like mikasa in the first place um 
a, you know, we, we are, from the beginning, we were a multimedia project. Um, we, we used a lot of different forms of media to um, put out uh, this uh, political conscious building, basically, within the community. Um, and it was more, uh, so we, we've done, Mikasa's uh, political artwork has included the creation of public installments of light signs. Um, there's been banner drops since. Um, we've, we've had a banner drop uh, like a year last summer, I guess it was, where we had, we actually did this banner drop uh, behind the Bushwick, I don't know if you guys know of the Bushwick Collective, but they, are, they have been one of the um, groups that has helped ex us accelerate the level of gentrification in the area, right? Because of the, the murals, basically. So we did uh, a banner drop last year uh, behind the, this block party that they do every year um, while they're on their stage, when somebody was on their stage, um, it was a famous singer. Um, and we did a big dra banner drop with, uh, in collaboration with another artist group uh, with uh, To Colonize This Place. We did this huge banner drop in the behind the stage where it said, you know, they want the art, not the people in English and Spanish. Um, so that was one of the last art things we've done because um, obviously we wanted to take back art. What Mikasa's point was to try to take back art for the people, by the people type of thing, because we know that living in New York and, and Brooklyn, I mean, there's always been art here, you know, um, even if they didn't call it art. You know, the graffiti writers and everything, those are artists, those are our artists. And, and I think that's kind of the point of of uh, Mikasa is that you know we wanted to take it back from the for the community to make their own art and to value our own ourselves as our own work you know and also the point of the the uh, the fact that we were doing all these uh, the different use of uh, media you know uh, we've done the pro we've done protest processions also we've done performance art actions we've done projections with like the uh, the illuminator in the past two projections against um the buildings and we've got and also in the when we were doing the light sign projections uh the first year we we actually went and filmed um a short documentary um of the different uh residents of, in bushwick that were being affected by the displacement um we worked with a, a little short doc that's actually not really finished but it's it's a very a very cool like time capsule that we created actually with christian from uh here and um but since then in 2018, we started, uh, we actually got involved more in the fight against the rezoning in Bushwick. They were trying to push a rezoning plan. Uh, this community board, uh, the community board, along with Espinal and Reynoso, uh, our council members here in Bushwick, were pushing for a, um, a huge, huge rezoning that would have rezoned um, it was about like 500 blocks something like that it was a crazy amount but it was a huge rezoning that was going to pass one of the biggest rezonings that have um and it would have allowed for uh the buildings to go up a level so that people can make like the luxury towers basically that are everywhere but you know in bushwick if you know and you live in bushwick you see that there's um, a lot of luxury towers that are just empty too which is a total crime so it's like um uh, so we were involved, we got involved in the fight, um, which we called it the battle for Bushwick, uh, which was, uh, against the rezoning. And we started, um, basically targeting a lot of the local, uh, council members and to stop it before, you know, this would ex ex already, you know, uh, exasperate the issue already, the, the displacement in the area. So, and that, that's definitely what was going to happen. So we actually, um, I think we won that battle to a degree. It, it stopped the the Bushwick rezoning plan did not pass um, as we we had been fighting and telling them like, yo, you can't give this to the Department of City Planning because the Department of City Planning never listens to community plans in the first place. And what happened was exactly that the the Department of City Planning um, uh, denied their the community plan that they had been working on this the non local nonprofits and stakeholders had been working on with the council members these past four or five years. Um, and they, they didn't even look at it. They didn't even want to work with it. So, and that's exactly our point. Our point was that the city never is not, they don't look for the benefit of, of working class poor black and brown people. So they're, they're not looking out for us at all. And, um, and they're never going to listen to any of our opinions. And that was kind of our, our point that the system is broken in the first place. So we shouldn't be going through this process because the process is, is, our, is what's messed up already. Um, so we, we, so right now we're in a pause because we don't know if that rezoning is going to be pushed again or not by future um, politicians that are coming up here locally. But you know we're 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 going to be ready to fight if if they do try to uh, continue push any kind of 
uh, especially the Department of City Planning, I try to push any kind of rezoning. Um, because obviously, when they talk about affordability and affordable housing, it's never affordable for the folks who already live here, these working class communities. So it's, uh, it's really, I was saying it was a little bit disheartening to hear, to see like the film, I, mean, I, I, I loved it and it was powerful and it influenced me, but it also um, made me sad because I was just like, you know, it's, it's the same issue that's continually, it's perpetual, you know, it's still working class poor people that are being pushed out, especially right now. Um, now that everything, after the pandemic, we've been getting a lot of, um, uh, messages from different tenants in the area who have started organizing their own buildings. Like, you know, these are people who are not uh, organizers. They're not like, you know, people who come from any organizing world, but a lot of people are just like out of necessity are starting to organize their own buildings in Bushwick. And, but the problem also with Bushwick is that Bushwick has so many, majority of Bushwick buildings are not regulated. Um, they're not regulated, so that means that they that people tenants have way less rights to stay and to fight um, to stay in their homes. So uh, with housing court, I mean, right? Um, so even though they've had this moratorium on evictions, obviously people, you know, once this uh, moratorium ends, the landlord can start, you know, all eviction proceedings, and that's the problem, right? So we've been um, so we've been trying to um, support the campaign. For the rent strikes and and for uh, the cancellation of the rent that uh, for Cuomo to cancel rent, so we've been pushing the right to uh, the right to counsel and and just housing justice for all's um, campaign thus far online and everything because a lot of our our force is online, a lot of people get our information through there. But we're also now starting to collaborate um, with Mayday Space to because Mayday Space is now doing the deliveries of groceries in the area to Bushwick uh, with a lot of the different mutual aid groups in the area, we are uh, now looking to start creating, well, we've already started creating some uh, uh, political education and know your rights materials that we're printing out to go within these um, deliveries so that we can uh, get all this information, like vital information, legal resources, you know, uh, know your rights uh, resources on like housing, immigration, domestic violence, and mental health resources. We're trying to get that those kinds of first like aid resources basically to the community first right now. And, um, and we're also looking to start creating more political education pieces just to kind of give context to what we're living because obviously uh, the situation is just being exasperated. Like uh, poor people have been always been suffering under um, capitalism and under capital uh, disaster capitalism, they're going to be, you know, suffering more as we have seen already. So we're, um, which is why also we've pivoted a lot of our, our work. Um, it's, it's not only again against the displacement of our communities, but also against the, the criminals, the, the criminalization of our communities, because that's uh, obviously when when they're trying to push us out, they're also trying to criminalize us. Um, so either they're pushing us out or they're incarcerating us, right? Because that's the way to get us get us out of these neighborhoods. So um, we're trying to put that. Uh, you know, with all the kinds of um, uh, art or media that we put out, it's always to try to uh, build um, political consciousness to try to uh, normalize radical thought and to try to normalize radical actions, which is also why a lot of the, the any kind of uh, media that we've ever created or art medium, I mean, I mean public art installations or whatever it is that we do, um, they are specifically uh, so that uh, the community um, it's, it's basically to build consciousness in, in general. And we're trying to do more of that. And now through uh, the political education pieces that we're trying to do with Mayday Space. A lot of the folks who have been reaching out to us that are tenants though, um, that are starting to organize within their communities in Bushwick, um, which is great because people need to organize their, ten their, their buildings even if they, they don't have all their rights, you know, um, as unregulated buildings. Um, uh, they've been in touch with us and we've been connecting them with different like legal resources mostly um, within the community so that people are uh, connected to at least like housing lawyers and everything because they're gonna need them after you know the moratorium is over so that's kind of in a nutshell what we've been up mm -hmm. to yeah thank you so much uh, that it's incredible I mean that you guys are continuing the work and you're absolutely right it is really um, complex I mean the cancel rent movement is incredible um, but just to add that, you know, in, chi in, in Chinatowns, in Brooklyn, Queens, and in Manhattan's Chinatown, it's also very complicated because rent is so, you know, high as we know that 
a lot of families um, often are living together um, in one apartment. Of course, these landlords, right, are cutting, you know, something that was like one apartment is now three apartments. And it gets complicated because that one leaseholder is subletting to a number of folks and not throwing shade at all on the family who has to sublet. It's the landlord, right, that is like eking out as many profits as they can. And so it's, it, you're absolutely right, it is very, very complicated. But uh, shout out to the folks who are on rent strike in Bushwick um, and in Chinatown, 81 Bowery, which is a whole entire building. They did a banner drop. Um, I think um, May 1st, of course, um, but they're still on rent strike. Um, and it's, um, I think I mentioned before, the, it, you know, I can chat in the in the chat box if you guys want to find out more info, but the landlord is making it really miserable for the um, Chinatown tenants um, in that building right now. Um, so I totally can relate to everything you're um, talking about. But um, I think you answered uh, the question uh, really on point about the powerful role of uh, media arts and culture um, in, in normal times and even in this pandemic. But I thought I'd ask if any, if um, either uh, Josh or Esperanza or Carol has anything to add around this moment right now. And um, we know that the power arts of arts, culture, and media can really move people to action. Um, so if you have anything to, uh, to sort of add on to before, yeah, Carol, please. Just briefly, that I feel like the role of media needs to be to collect these stories and put them out there. How do we know what's happening at 81 Bowery? How do we know what's happening in Bushwick? I right. think that's, that was the value that Third World Newsreel has to give to the struggle of, of working and poor people in this in the city is to let those stories be revealed. And I think, um, I think that's what we tried to do in break, with Break and Enter. We were totally, totally moved by what we saw happening in people's lives, the disruption, the, the chaos, the pain, the suffering, the hard work of transforming apartments that were broken by the police and by the landlords where they just like, I don't know if you remember those photographs of the toilets and the plumbing being destroyed and people having to put the pipes back together. The kind of work that went on, the labor that people did to make those apartments habitable was incredible. And we tried to show that. The fact that women were working with their children taking care of their babies and their families and other people's babies and families as well. Just, and at the same time, the places they were living in were barely habitable. They had to work to paint those and clean those and plaster them and do all of that work, as well as strategize and figure out what's the next step. There were 35 buildings that were taken over. What's the next building? Who's the next family mm -hmm. that's going to be ready to sacrifice everything that's calm and peaceful and useful in their lives right now? And as SB said, they were fighting and struggling for their lives. So I feel like what Newsreel did back then in 1971, which feels like a really long time ago to me, um, was basically collect those stories and reflect them back to people so that people would feel their own strength and their own energy. We sat in meeting after meeting and uh, tried to learn what people were thinking they could do next to support their community and to support themselves so that they could survive, you know? And uh, I think that what May, the May Day Collective did where they talked about all the services and the resources they had to offer their community was powerful, it was great. It was a short film, but it told the story. Mm -hmm. It made me want to go and visit and learn more about May Day. But I think that, um, I think that what we did with Break and Enter is that we recorded history. And that's why almost 50 years later, people still want to watch the mm -hmm. film and still find it revelatory, still find 
that it has something to offer. I don't have the answers. I don't think any of us have the answers. Mm -hmm. This is a terrible time that we're living in. People are struggling again just to survive, you know? And it's, it's uh, heartbreaking to think mm -hmm. that, that you guys in May Day have to deliver 700 bags of food to people. These are working people. These are people who have tried to live well and be part of a community for their whole lives. And now they're, they have to depend on getting baskets of food from other people. Mm -hmm. um, it's very, very hard, very hard times ahead. I hope New Newsreel can continue to do this important work. Yeah, and, the, and uh, I know at the end, there'll be an announcement of future screenings and um, discussions that folks can log on to. Yes. Um, and it's just so amazing that, that, that you all have been able to host these. Uh, we're gonna go to Josh and then uh, SB, if that's okay? Yeah, okay. okay. Thank you. Yeah, Josh. thank you, Betty and Carol. I think one thing that I think the, uh, the role of arts and cultural organizing can play is bridging um, the lack of relationships or connections between young people like myself. I'm 30 years old, although <clears throat> I'm 30 years old, although I know I have a baby face and I get carded all the time. And folks like Carol and Esperanza, who've been doing this work since the 70s. I mean, I grew up in New York City. I grew up in Bushwick and Ridgewood as well. I went to school in Midtown right there on 56 and 10th. And I had no idea about Operation Move In until two weeks ago when I saw this film. And um, here I was at Mayday when I first got involved, I was 24 years old, thinking I knew everything. And, you know, there are stories like this, like Operation Move In and, and the work you guys did, that's like, folks have been doing this, you know, especially our folks, our elders, our grandparents, um, grandparents of color. And so I think more of this, where my generation, you know, the, the younger kids that grew up in New York City, that are doing this for the first time, connecting with folks like y'all that have been doing this is really important. I don't have enough of it in my life. I know the younger organizers around me don't have a lot of it. Um, so that's one thing I think that, that that's a role that it can play. So this call is an example of it. Absolutely, you're absolutely right. The intergenerational aspect of this call right here, like not just the panelists, but everyone that I'm seeing the faces is, actually so unique and beautiful um, because I've been on so many Zoom calls and it's never been this intergenerational and multiracial, so it's amazing. Um, SB. Oh, okay, I think she might be talking to someone else. Uh, oh, SB, we can't, oh. Well, I, can't, I forget to unmute myself. <laughs> no <laughs> uh, the, um, You know, we're talking about the role of media, so there's bourgeois media, this media of the rich. And I think that what has happened is, and during that period, it was also the case, is that even the progressive media has been absorbed by the media of the rich, of the bourgeoisie. That is very, very clear. So during that period, we couldn't do Zoom, we didn't have distribution. So we were committed, right? And Carol was committed. And that's why the film is filmed in the same way. And Carol talked about it was to inspire uh, the people who were doing the work. Actually, this film, it's not, you know how people make film for an audience out there? This film was made for the audience in the struggle. So one of the things about distribution, maybe Carol would want to talk more about this, is that it was taken to different communities, actually, and shown, as Carol said earlier, on walls in Brooklyn, in the Bronx, in Queens, in Harlem, where any, wherever there was a community in, in struggle, part of the role of media was how do we get this beyond this community? And I think that it, they did an excellent, an excellent job because you know the 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 112th Street squatters 
were basically generated by this film. The squad was in the Lower East Side. This film did kept generating people for many, many years. I mean, for me, it's a real privilege that I'm still alive and I could give history and I could give a background on this film. When we were making it, we were not thinking, when we were in the struggle, we were not thinking about the future, right? If we had been thinking about the future, we had we would have put together a a hundred year work plan to make sure that housing was available to folks and was affordable. You know, I say a hundred years because I'm seventy four right now. So for me, if we had done that, then it would have been real difference. One of our challenges which impact organizing now, after we took over the, the two things, you know, you get partial victories in these struggles. We, we haven't won the war. We, be, we, we win battles, we win battles. So we were able, and there are people still who have these apartments that we opened up and we negotiated 30% of low income housing in the high risers, which we got 30%, right? But we wanted it to be for low income housing. Now, because we didn't have watchdogs, right? Today, if, if low-income housing was a $10,000 a year or less income at that time, today it's like $50,000 and 75. That's not low-income household. That doesn't make it accessible. That's why I believe that we need to plan, not only for today, but for the future generations to come. We need to create that vision, that, that vision. A squatting is a strategy, right? Like voting is a strategy. Neither squatting, occupying buildings, or voting is going to take us to freedom. You know, so the question is, what is our long-term goal? If we want to be free, if we want to be free of capitalism, then we have to create. We have to create. Mm -hmm. And no, look, one of the real challenges that El Comité had, El Comité lasted 10 years. For 10 years, it was a volunteer organization for 10 years. And there were internal struggles, you know, and I said to you that the, you know, the movement, the left political movement was decimated by cultural poor. We were uh, decimated um, and the Comité was holding on. However, one has to be real careful with reform work mm -hmm. and those who really get, get brought, they believe that the answer is in reform work. I have nothing, I have there's nothing wrong with reform work. You have to, the strategies, you have to work with the state, the federal, the state, the city, you have to really give it to the uh, push on the people of power. And one of the things that really hurt us in the 80s is that a lot of our people, you know, a lot of the folks that were in the Comité were the people in the Dinkins campaign who, you know, became the head of housing 
Can you imagine 10 years of political activism for the left lane, left lens, and then you become, with all the strategies that you have developed, mm -hmm. to be the head of housing, right? So yeah. how do we, for the long haul, take a moment in time, learn from it, and then begin to strategize and use all the different forms mm -hmm. of direct action, reform work, everything you could use, but with the vision that our work is to be free, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. And actually, it's a perfect segue to the last Sorry, I muted myself. Um, so I'm gonna skip to the last question because I know there is so much chatter on the chat box, which is a great, um, lot of questions. But this one question is really relevant and segues nicely from what you just said about the future, right? Um, and specifically, as we've been talking about, the COVID pandemic is, has, is uncovering racial and economic injustices that has been going on for a very long time, right? Especially in communities of color, pre-pandemic. But more and more uh, of us are really using this time to really think about what kind of society we want to live in and fight for. We know this current system is not working whatsoever. Um, so what kind of society can we imagine at this time? Um, and there are no right or wrong answers, but I'm just curious from the other three panelists, um, if you can just speak to it, uh, maybe in like two minutes each, and then we'll go to the questions. Um, but just in terms of using this moment to think more, we know what we're fighting against, but what are we fighting for? Right? What does liberation look like post pandemic or, or, or uh, uh, yeah. It, so, so if, if, I don't know who wants to kick it off, um, maybe I'll call on Patti, she wants to kick it off. Um, and anything you can offer, I think, in this moment. And really, uh, SB said it so beautifully, right? Um, but yeah, Patti, uh, you're on um, so yeah, we've been talking about this a lot because I feel like um, even Mikasa in its beginnings, and I think a lot of these orgs um, in, in, in the beginning, you start with an opposition and just be like, okay, what are we against? What are we going for, right? We definitely need to give that alternative. And I, and I think that's where we're at now because we're uh, in, while we're in here in quarantine, we're kind of, uh, we've all been under this, these ideas, um, which is also why I think because of so first, we do see people who are non-organized are starting to like activate, right? Because now out of necessity, which is a big, big um, important thing for us mm -hmm. to see, to recognize, and to and to empower, I guess, to nurture, right? Um, because that uh, people are doing that on their own and out of necessity, meaning people are coming, getting out of their comfort zone, which is basically what we all kind of needed to to eventually create some kind of critical mass, right? So I think we're at a very crucial point in history where um, I know that there's a lot of mutual aid going on because folks need it, obviously, because all the, all the shit, all these issues, uh, intersectional issues that affect poor uh, people of color in New York City are now uh, being so much more exacerbated and everything. So it's, I think, um, it, with this in mind, though, we uh, I think a lot of folks because they're doing mutual aid and it's more uh, you know people are, are doing deliveries and everything you know some people are saying it's charity some people are saying it's mutual aid but the, the thing without with it is that um, people aren't organizing and I think there is now an opportunity to organize folks even more so and easier now because people are out of that comfort zone because people are seeing how everything's fucking crumbling out low, uh, you know around us right um, so. Um, with which is why we were like, okay, well, if people are doing the, the mutual, the, you know, doing the deliveries and everything, I think this is the way to organize them is to get them through the deliveries. And I'm thinking this hopefully could be something of a city wide level. And, we, and I have been talking with different organizers from different parts of the city um, who have, who are also on this on this same th um, plan. Basically, they're also starting to write up materials, political education to put this context. But at the same time, and I've been talking to different groups for our purposes for this project in Bushwick too and um, for the deliveries, we want to also have a vision, like to put out a vision in, in these in these uh, materials, you know, like, like, yo, like what kind of world do we want to live in? And when I think about that and, and um, I think about like, you know, 
real affordable housing. Like, why can't all housing be one price? And it's like, you know what, like, why can't all housing be low? You know, it's like, I, I don't understand, you know, there's, um, I think if, if we were to build things that are actually low income housing, that were that was actually solar powered that was not using you know the same energies you know that 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 is you know fucking up the earth and fucking up our people um you know and uh, you know i mean because you know we have um and to this effect actually um my well mikasa has been starting uh to work on a campaign against um the uh, we're revving up basically our fight, uh, a grassroots fight for our homes and our land now, because right now we're actually fighting uh, a new target, right? We're going to be uh, starting to fight, which is National Grid. National Grid and also the um, uh, the regulators here in New York City who who do that, um, who, who let them in, basically, all the politicians who let them in. So, um, because they're trying to push a, a fracking pipeline through Bushwick right now, well, through North Brooklyn, actually. So it's already in East New York and and Brownsville, and it's and now it's being built through Bushwick to end um, in Williamsburg, and I think in Greenpoint. So we've been fighting that right now. Where we've actually just started that fight because we know that this this is something that's going to affect our water. It's going to affect our you know it can explode right. There's I mean, and why are they doing that in these communities of color? Obviously, it's because they can and, and they don't want us there. And if this is another way to get us out, it might you know. It probably is right, like so. Because if you're putting fracking, they're gonna. That's really gonna like affect the quality of the water. So, um, so we're thinking of bigger things like policy, and I definitely agree um, with. I'm sorry. So I, I definitely agree that we need to um, think about like the future in in a more coherent way, and 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 present that to the public. Like we need to we need to give vision that there is a totally other future that we can go towards. Right. I mean solar powered pyramids i always say right <laughs> or like you know where there's like great green gardens and things why why can't we think of that like a totally other world that new york city can become you know brooklyn can become um and i think we're working on that kind of materials to like put that out more um and i think with these uh with the written docs at least because i, I i'm just thinking about the future and how how we can actually get this information to people because of the social distancing. I think, I mean, eventually people are going to be able to go out more and with the mask and everything with protocol. But like for now, I think if we can start doing things through the written, send things to people, you know, because a lot of people don't even have access to internet. You know, a mm -hmm. lot of our communities are, are, are not, uh, you know, internet literate and, and people don't have, you know, the, the capacity to get in the computers and everything. So, I, which is why we've been trying to see if we can start doing this whole print thing, zine wise, and, and get things, comics, social justice comics out to kids, you know, there are different things that things that, that can be engaged and activated in the community. So I think mm. um, that's one of the ways, and we're, we're looking to um, start, uh, you know, and it's basically we're, we're trying to really get to those folks, like to the kids, to the younger people who probably have more time, because I think one of the issues here also has been that, you know, a lot of people can't become organizers unless they're organizing their own their own building or something. Right. Which is great. And, and we're encouraging that, too. But it um, but I also know that our communities are most of their time, you know, um, just looking for ways how to survive, right? Like there, a lot of their time is spent on surviving and because of capitalism and everything. So I'm, so I think my, uh, which is why um, I, we're trying to target, we're trying to activate the younger people, the kids of these people, the, the teens, right? The, their, their children. So I think like uh, if we start doing more material, printed materials also that has to do specifically with a vision for younger people to start looking towards, you know? I think that might be the way too, but obviously with the guidance of like the elders who have been through this fight already, you know, uh, I just don't, I guess like the only thing is that we, we, we would really need to like, to, I'd like to see more of a connection between the citywide stuff too for this kind of fight, especially like, and if we want to start taking over buildings or whatever, right? But I am very much for community control policies too. I think that's probably the best um for people to be uh, in charge of what's going on within their own locality and in w within their own neighborhoods, like people should be the ones deciding what can come in and what can't, what kind of developments are coming in. And if it's going to be development, it should, you know, there has to be a whole new change to what is a, what's affordable in New York city. I mean, there's so many things that need to be changed. Um, but 
it needs to be controlled by the local communities. I, 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 I am definitely for that. I think we're, we're pushing towards that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you for that. And, um, I don't know if Carol, um, or Josh, if you have anything to add, maybe because I, I want to make sure we get to the questions, anything around sort of, uh, vision on the, of, of, on the future, you guys both kind of talked about it already, but if you wanted to add anything before we open it up to questions, no. Okay. Yeah, See, I know from Josh. Thank you. Carol. I, yeah. I just yeah, want to say one thing and I'll say it quickly. Uh, we're six months away from a national election. I am very pragmatic. I am fearful of fascism. And I believe that the current Republican Party and Trump would like nothing better than to install him and the, themselves as a fascist dictatorship. And I think that um, I have never been involved in electoral party work before. However, I believe that because of the undereducation of the population in this country, which is spiked the racism that exists that we've been talking about, and the all, all the work that we have to do right now between now and November is we have to make sure people, young people, old people, people get out there somehow and vote. And we have to make sure that we can change the government at this point. I'm being very pragmatic and I know people are probably saying, oh, this is boring. You know, we want a solar populated, well, so do I. I want community control too. But I'm telling you right now, this guy is really dangerous. He's got blood on his hands. 86,000 people have died in our mm -hmm, country. Mm -hmm. And we need to stop mm -hmm. Trump. Mm -hmm. And whatever it takes to do that, we need to organize to do that. There's less than six months between now and the election. Yeah. And I'm, I'm not a fan of Biden's, but mm -hmm. I feel like there's yeah. got to be some energy we put into that as well. Yeah. Okay. So um, I think we have all different viewpoints on, you know, electoral politics versus grassroots organizing and where the power comes from, the short and the long term. But any, you know, and, and, and that's fair. Uh, to say that for everyone on this call as well, but I'm going to um, put it out to, I know Christian's been moderating, you know, monitoring the whole entire chat chain um, and thread and it's, it's very, it's popping. <laughs> so I'm just going to throw it to him maybe for the first, and we've actually organized the questions a little bit in back yeah. I believe. So, yeah, so I could, I, I could talk a little bit about, about that. So I, there's been a lot of really great questions that have come up. I do feel like there have been a couple of things that were addressed that I think does answer a couple of questions. So for the sake of yeah. time, I'm going to prioritize things that I feel like maybe we didn't get too much into. And then I do want to preface by saying that if there are any questions that we don't get to, right, that uh, folks can send an email to twn at uh, twn.org. JT, is that correct in terms of, no? <laughs> I, I can't hear you, JT. Uh, oh, no. Send to workshop. Okay, so sorry, uh, for folks who are interested, if we don't get to your questions, send them to workshop at, at twn.org. So workshop at twn.org. And we'll either address them, right, or we'll make sure to connect you with whoever can address that, uh, you know, of, of the folks that are part of our panel today. Um, and uh, Rosalie just put it on our chat, so if, if anything. Um, but yeah, so I guess to, to kind of start us off, like uh, there are uh, questions that, particularly are leading towards, you know, uh, bringing up really critical questions when it comes to working with people who are not particularly within our communities, right? And I think this question is specifically directed at folks who are doing some work in Bushwick, like uh, Mikasa and the Mayday Space, but I think that this could also be posed to other folks, Carol and Espe. Um, uh, this was a, a kind of an amalgam of different questions put together by uh, Rosemary, Carmen, and Christopher. Um, I was born and raised in Ridgewood and Bushwick and have a have participated in some of the anti-displacement protests, but have noticed that many of the people present are young white folks. I noticed that some, uh, the same in community spaces like the May Day space. I personally feel uncomfortable with their presence as a woman of color who grew up poor uh, in Ridgewood and Bushwick, but I would like to hear uh, the panelists' thoughts on, on this, right? My question is centered on the space white folks take in anti-displacement movements, uh, in our neighborhoods. And then Marina adds, is there suggestions that you have, or kind of an amalgam of different things, not just specifically word for what Marina says, um, is there suggestions of, uh, sorry, 
is there suggestions you have in working with folks who do not experience oppression the way that we do to effectively move forward? I could address this if you let me. <laughs> okay. Sure. Yeah. Um, look, the issue with racism with is and coming together by people of different uh, ethnic groups is that because of historical history that has created all this historical privilege, people of color are not at the same level as white folks. So it's fine that they organize from a non-racist lens. And it is, it is imperative that we organize our people and bring them up to a level that they could be at the table with white folks and call them out on their racist behavior. You know, I always say, the worst racists are anti-racists because they still have the attitudes and they don't cop to them. So uh, for the sister who raised the question, you know, organize your folks, hon. Organize your folks. Look, I've been organizing women of color in poor working class communities forever and a day. Nobody hears about my organizing. It's not out there, but that's what I do. And there's powerful organizers out there have been and have come through some of my trainings. Um, so, you know, each one, each one teach one. Most of our people don't read or write. Our children, you know, they're dropping out of eighth grade. The amount of us that have more than an eighth, eighth grade education are not that many. So we have a responsibility. We're the watchdogs in our community. We bring our people up. So that's what I would recommend. And I also recommend that all white folks do undoing racism. They got to get it, you know, just because you proclaim yourself to be an anti-racist doesn't mean anything. You need to work internalized oppression and understand racism from a historical perspective. So that's my recommendation to everybody. Do undoing racism. You know, prepare yourself. I mean, we have to go into preparedness mode. People talk as post-pandemic. Guess what? This is the new norm, and it's called pandemic, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That's what it is. And it's like people talk, people have been talking about, about capitalism being in crisis. This is what? It looks like when capitalism is in crisis. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is it, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? This is it. So we need to strategize, to politically strategize, and use every tactic available to bring it down, right? So I'm not big into electoral politics, but that's a tactic, right? That's a tactic. But the thing is not, don't make that the, the, the strategy. It's a tactic. So you need to understand the difference between tactics and, and strategies to move forward and to organize in a very big way. Thank yeah. you so much, Esther. Yeah, that was great. Patti. I see you want to chime in, of course, because this question was also about Bushwick organizing, right? Right. SB, I totally agree with you, everything that you said. Also, um, just with, the, with regards to in the spaces, yes. So 
white people are present in different organizing spaces. Um, but for, I know, same for Mayday Space and Mikasa, um, or Josh could talk more to Mayday Space, but, um, um, and I want to quote what Marina wrote here, actually, because that's the truth. Movements need to be POC led first and foremost. We cannot wait to let our work to ever be co-opted again. And this is true. I think when we talk about organizing, you will see white folks because white folks are, they have more privilege, they have more time to work on different things, right? They have more skills because of the privilege that they've been given all their lives. So a lot of them bring skills to a lot of this organizing work. So if we have them included, it's because they, they were down to do the work. But uh, and a, I guess a tip for white people who are listening or who want to get involved in this kind of work ever or in any kind of work within these communities, period, right? Not just housing, um, is that you need to realize that you first, just as SB said, you need to work on yourself first, your own politics first. Don't like, don't expect others to help, like give you knowledge, especially people of color to get, to do that labor for you. So you will have to have had that done first, right? You have to come with low ego because you understand that white supremacy is what is dictated within capitalism and that's why we're all fucked. And so I think people need to like understand that first and foremost and then once you're done, you know that you, you've done that work and you understand that and you gotta leave your ego at the door. You also have to work um, and then you gotta put in the work. Like white people, when they're in these spaces, at least in our spaces, if they're in our spaces, it's because they're putting in the work and they're and they're and they're putting their ego down like it's not it's not about them it's about this community and those most impacted which is why those most impacted mm -hmm. most marginalized need to be the ones leading um so and and that doesn't mean you have you have to lead by yourself though right because like that's the thing uh, marginalized people are marginalized because we have less privileges because we have less time we have so we need more support in into a, to lead so th that's the i think the point with all this so um uh, I think like more, the organizations are definitely specifically trying to um, lead from that perspective, from from the marginalized perspective, and I think that that should be something that should be citywide or like everywhere. Like people should be doing that in order to really get because the people who are gonna be, the people most impacted and most marginalized are gonna be the ones who are gonna be able to create or envision the solutions, what they need, what are the needs of the community and everything. So I think um, it's more of that. We need to cultivate leadership of, of those uh, people of color within the community already, right? Um, but in order to cultivate that, you know, um, we also have to understand that people with less privileges can't, don't have the time to organize sometimes. I don't have certain skills and different things. And we, and we don't want to force them to either. Like if they can't, like, I don't want to force an, a marginalized person to work more than they're already doing, right? Like to survive for their families, right? Um, but, uh, but I will say like, yeah, it's leadership that needs to be, uh, very much centered with those, the marginalized. Yeah. And, and, and uh, Josh is okay with not answering. Uh, uh, he just wrote me so we can move on. I know there are a lot of questions. So, um, I guess you, 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 you said it perfectly for, for Mayday and for Mikasa's work, um, since it's so closely aligned. Um, Christian, I know there are a bunch of other questions. Yeah. Um, so uh, one other question came uh, for, and, and I think that we did go into this too, right, into revisioning what could be like new strategies for organizing, particularly on this level of what's going on in, in, in uh, through the pandemic, right? But I did want to pose this just in case there were other things that folks do have in mind in terms of thinking through how we can vision forward or vision collectively about what could be happening within the organizing movement uh, for uh, just housing, right? And, and, you know, the rights of our communities. But uh, so, uh, uh, you know, how, uh, Marina asked how uh, they see will be, sorry, <laughs> I'm trying to like make sure that the wording is, is right. But uh, in terms of affordable housing in a post-pandemic city, uh, like how can we expect, uh, you know, this to, regarding displacement and dis disvestment of certain communities, you know, that work kind of push for, um, you know, what we are, uh, what our communities actually need, right? So um, someone adds, uh, if you each could choose a systemic process that could change, which one would it be in terms of just like thinking about the next moves on the, the uh, housing issues, particularly kind of like within the sh shifting landscapes of the pandemic? And that would be for anybody or everybody who wants to answer. Anyone itching to maybe just raise your hand or, or, I, or I can just call on someone? Oh, oh, 
Espy, did you want to? Okay. I do, look, I think about these things a lot, right? I have, I've been in, in, in my bed, in my, like everybody is, 60 days thinking, right? And I, my life is organizing. That's what I do. Um, so whether it is housing, whether it's education, whatever the issue, healthcare, whatever the issue is, we need to educate ourselves on the issue and we need to educate the people we're going to work with to be able to organizing and agitate and get them to want to move forward. Now, the schools are not doing that. You know, the, 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 the colleges, the high schools, they're just churning out technical people and they're just and functionaries. The ability to think is critical. And that's what we need to develop our folks, to be able to analyze. You know, one of the things our folks have, and when I say our folks, I'm talking about poor working class people, in particular, a women of color, but our folks in general, is they don't see a future outside of today. Outside of today, there's no future. There's no hope. You know, people always ask, how come you in, in the 60s and 70s, you all did what you did, you know? That's because we had hope, because we had possibility. Nowadays, there's no hope, there's no possibility, right? So in all our work, wherever we are, let's teach critical thinking and let's not work from fear. Let's work from possibility. My like capitalism works for the capitalists. It doesn't work for us. So we need to be creative and figure out 199 ways to bring it down. And I think the first thing is educate our people, give them back their history. History informs, that's why people get very excited about the film. That is history. And it informs us in the future about possibilities of how we can move forward. You know? And look, sweat equity is a, is a tactic. It's a tactic, right? Mm -hmm. The people, and somebody asked me this before, I think, the people in, in it's interesting, the white folks in, in, um, in the squatters, wonderful women, a, they started sweat equity programs. That's how they made a living, right? And they were very good programs. I mean, they still exist today, many of them. And you should see how horrendous they turned out to be. So it's a tactic that we use, right? So think about what are the tactics? You know, and some people like to raise voting up to a, a, a strategy, but it's a tactic, right? It's a tactic. Yep. You know, we are, I don't know what to call us, you know, but we are like, we are the straw. I'm not, is it the straw? You know, we are whatever broke the camel's back. Okay? That's who we are. So we have to, you know, Malcolm said it, his birthday is on the 19th. We got to do it by any means necessary. But no, understand how capitalism works. 
you know, uh, we've been doing an online workshop on power and oppression, how capitalism works. Uh, I don't know if, if, if Marina, you could post something on that. Um, but that's what we need to learn at this period. We got to go back. We got to read Pablo Freire. We got to read Fanon, you know, that show us the way. We've got to look at the Panthers. 10 point pro program, the young laws, Iwakun, you know, these young people. I mean, I was 24 years old in 1970. We were amazing. We were courageous, you know? So we need that. We need that. And we need to bring up the spirit that mm -hmm. no matter what, we're going to win. And no matter what they do to us, you know? So they bring on this pandemic. They bring on this pandemic. Well, guess what? We're going to con continue the battle because we're committed to win the war. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Josh, did you want to add something to this uh, piece or this, to this question? Sure. I mean, I'll keep it brief because Esperanza, you're amazing, and going at, going after you is really hard. Um, I like you a lot too. <laughs> but I, I mean, it's part of it is like echoing everything you said. I think I, I'm struggling with the question uh, because I think I'm rejecting the premise of it that there's one issue, right? I'm 30 years old. What do I know? I've been organizing for six years, um, but I think the premise of the question assumes that there's one thing that could be a silver bullet. And it isn't one thing. I mean, we know the system is the problem. Capitalism is the problem. Um, and it's just hard to choose one thing. One thing is not going to solve it, right? And I think instead of saying what I think should be the, the solution, I think we're going to see it from our people. I mean, our people, uh, when I say our people, it's working class people of color. When shit hits the fans, they organize and they mobilize and they come up with radical solutions that we never even thought of or dreamed of. Um, so I'm looking to be part of that, looking to see what emerges. Mutual aid networks are something that were mentioned, but they're not in the radical tradition, at least what we're seeing, uh, the way that the Panthers and the Young Lords did it. Um, so I think our, our folks are going to come through. They always do. Um, and agree with uh, what we're seeing in the chat and um, what Esperanza said is that studying is everything. So I'll leave it at that, check. Thank you, Josh. Um, and so I just wanna make sure that we have enough time to close out, right? Uh, so uh, for the next question, it is a little bit of a general question, which I think does uh, gravitate back to the films that we watched, right? Um, particularly with Break and Enter. So Wing asks, I feel like the film Break and Enter is not just a document, but intentionally or not, also a guidance for future generations about the possibility of ways a community can fight against gentrification, right? And we talked about a lot of different strategies and tactics, right? Which are different things, right? The strategies and tactics. Um, but like, if there are any key learning specifically about uh, strategies or tactics seen within that film, or even in the, the Mayday, the art building community, what are some things that you all in this panel want to kind of uplift um, as like things that you would want folks to just remember to take with them after this, this conversation? I think Carol had your hand up. Yeah, just briefly that I think that people in communities know the answers to what they need. And in Operation Move-In, you saw that people formed childcare centers, they had their own newsletter, they had meetings where they discussed what was important to them as a community. And their needs at, at that time emerged and were crystallized and resolved and i think um i think that it, what sp was talking about about education is critically important because you're right sp what you're talking about the history of oppression in this country and in other parts of the world is not being taught in the public school system you know and teaching people how to think critically is not happening in the public school system. Teaching people how to be independent thinkers isn't happening. 
but I believe that in communities, through what Josh was saying, mutual aid societies, all of that will bring people's needs to the surface and people will figure out creative ways to resolve those needs if given an opportunity to have their voice heard. So um, those are some of the things I would raise up from that film, things that I learned from that film. Would anyone else uh, like to chime in on that question, particularly yeah. on, oh, Espa, sorry. <laughs> yes, uh, look, I was on the, on the, on the a uh, zoom meeting with the housing strike people i was listening i wasn't participating but one of the things that they say is housing is a human right right and they want to abolish rents they're ab rent abolitionists like all the prison abolitionists out there. I mean, politic that's the strategy. Long-term strategy is healthcare, rent, education, everything will be free, right? And it's, it's great. So if that's where we're going, I've, I've, I use, you know, because when I tell people educate, I'm not talking to give people a capital to read or the Communist Manifesto. I'm not talking about that. Basic. People don't know the, the they don't know the Constitution of the United States. People don't know the debt debt declaration of human rights begin with that right basic know your rights campaigns that's why they're so important and from there you go further and further and further but you need a place to begin we need a place to begin yes we need to begin also serving the people right Serving the people, and in serving the people, you give them food, you give them clothing, you find shelter for them, you do X, Y, and C, and you teach them how to think clear, clinically. Everybody knows, you know, you you teach a person, you give you give people a person a fish, they eat for a day, right? You teach a person how to fish. They will fish forever, become self-sufficient. Su so that's our role. Yes, a different world is possible. Some of us are living that right now or attempting to do that. You know? We have to be Harriet Tubman. We have to free the minds of people so they could be free. And I think, look, I think everybody is doing an exceptional job. They're being unreasonable in a very big, big way. And then we have to step it up a notch, right? Because we're human beings. And we get tired. The Zooming thing is exhausting. I only try to do one or twice a, a week, but it's eating us up also. And we have to begin to talk to each other, even if we're like six, what is it, six uh, feet away from each other. We need to reclaim our humanity because that's what capitalism does. It alienates us. This is the biggest alienation that they've ever done. The other thing is, look, teach the history. Look, I believe, I love history. I love history. And do you know that I did not know that there was a pandemic in 
1918 and 1919. And I did not know that people were organizing around that time also. Uh, 